Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, our first speaker today is Jason, and he graduated with his BS in electrical engineering from the University of Connecticut in 2013. He received his MS in electrical engineering from UIEC in 2015 and is currently pursuing a PhD in electrical engineering under Professor Krein. His research interests are in renewable energy, power electronics, and grid integration. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, the title of my talk is Solar Variability Reduction Using Off-Maximum PowerPoint Tracking and Energy Storage Systems. This is the outline, so I'll go through the motivation for the research, which is increasing solar capacity on the grid, uh, the control strategy we propose with an overview of how the strategy works, and some stimulation results, and then the conclusion. So over the past 20 years, solar's really gone from a novel elect electricity generation source to kind of the fastest growing electricity uh, generation in the country uh, by source. So with this come a couple problems. So solar has no moving parts or rotational inertia. So when a cloud goes over the array, we see a step decrease in the output of the array. And likewise, when the cloud leaves the array, we see a step increase. Um, and also, because we, if we don't have or if we don't have forecasting, then we have poor predictability for when clouds will actually go over our array or not. And so this has led to um, people referring to solar as a negative load instead of a generation capacity. So instead of um, treating it like other generation sources, such as coal-fired plants or uh, natural gas, we think of it as a negative load, which it just takes away part of the load um, that the other generation sources uh, have to make up. So as you probably know, PV arrays track the irradiance profile. So if you have a clear day, then you get a clear energy profile throughout the day. But you can also have a partly cloudy day where you have clouds constantly moving on and off your grid. And then this, of course, imposes large power transients on the output of your array, which have to be absorbed somewhere. So you can either absorb them on the grid side or on the array side. And we see these uh, transients no matter the size of the array. So this is data taken from the U of I solar farm down the south side of town, where um, we can see uh, step changes in the array output on the order of a couple megawatts. Uh, on relatively small timescales. So the variability in the array has to be handled somewhere. So if we handle it on the grid, um, which is traditionally what's been done, where you just assume the spinning reserves of the grid will uh, handle the transients, um, this has worked in the past, but with increasing capacity, then this cause uh, has some cause for concern. And we'll either need to increase the spinning reserves on the grid to accommodate more solar or we'll have to limit the solar capacity that the grid can support. On the other hand, if we rely on an energy storage system to absorb the transients, we have to size the energy storage system to be able to absorb pretty much the max transient that we expect out of the array. And this is, a, of course, an expensive solution, um, considering that uh, energy storage systems are um, priced on, on the order of the array and especially if you need to replace the energy storage system several times through the life of the array. So solar arrays can last 25 years plus, but a battery system may only last a decade. Uh, so the motivation for this is, can we reduce some of the variability of the array uh, through the array control? So the standard array control is just maximum power point tracking. So the output of the array just tracks the radiance profile. And this, is, oh, this has been done because it gives you the best energy production, but it also imposes the greatest degree of variability. So if you want to decrease the variability, then you'd need either a large uh, energy storage system, such as a battery, to absorb those transients from the max to the mid, or you would need uh, to do something on the grid size. So what we're proposing, that instead of tracking the maximum power point, if we attract uh, if we track the moving average maximum power point uh, throughout the day, then that will decrease the size of the, well, so that will either in decrease the size of the energy storage system we need to reduce the variability, or it will reduce um, the variability we impose on the grid. So uh, the way this works is that, so we just take the moving, so what I'm showing here is just the moving average of the maximum power point throughout the day. Um, so when in a period of high variability, the 
uh, set point decreases, so we naturally uh, need a. So the idea is that during a periodizability, by reducing the set point, you also reduce the amount of uh, storage you would need to to kind of operate at that set point. And if you're operating at the set point because it's just a moving average, you would get the same energy production that you'd get out of the maximum power point uh, array. But if you can't get to uh, the set point, say your battery's not sized large enough, you'll still get reduced variability on the array. And this kind of just um, reiterates that point. So if we zoom in on the previous graph, um, the reduced set points shown in red and the maximum power points shown in blue. So when we have a step change in the irradiance, uh, we'll see a much smaller step change in the, in the set point. Uh, whereas if we were operating at the maximum power point, we see much larger. So whether we're relying on the grid to absorb this transient or we're relying on a battery system to absorb this transient, both, um, both metrics uh, are reduced by operating at the set point. So we can implement this control pretty simple um, using a low-pass filter and some curtailment value, this, this gain right here, C, um, where we just take the low-pass uh, we just low pass filter the maximum power point and then times it by the curtailment to get our set point. So the curtailment value is a tunable parameter that we're using here that we can relate to either the size of the storage we have on our system. So if we have a small um, battery pack, then we'd want a large, or then we'd want to curtail the set point um, such that we don't, uh, such that we can actually reach the set point. Whereas if we have a larger uh, battery system, then we can be more aggressive and operate closer to the average output of the day. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So setting the gain, so we don't wanna just set a constant curtailment value throughout the day, because then that could cause us to have bad performance during various times. So if we have too high of a variability, too high of a, um, or if we have a, basically no curtailment, so a curtailment value of one wouldn't curtail at all, um, and that could cause us during periods of high variability to inject too much, um, either to re rely too much on our storage system or inject too much uh, variability onto the grid. But if we have too low of a curtailment factor, then we'll get poor energy harvest uh, throughout the day. So the red line here is showing a low uh, fixed curtailment value and the cyan line showing uh, uh, too high. So what we propose is that you use an adaptive curtailment value um, that will change throughout the day. So we're calc So one way we found that you can calculate this adapted value is to look at the difference between your maximum power um, point and its low pass filter component, um, which is, uh, I'm uh, naming the P diff, and that's shown there on the right. So when P diff is positive, that means our maximum power point's above our set point, so we can just operate at the set point using the inverter with no battery. So we really only care when P diff is negative, because that means um, that would have to either be made up uh, by uh, the battery, or that would be uh, basically the variability we're injecting on the grid. Um, so if we, but if we base our curtailment factor on this rapidly changing values here, then we'd be changing our set point too much. So we propose taking the average of the, the P diff and using that as a gain value for our curtailment factor. So the idea here is that during um, a period of high variability, you'll accumulate this error um, much more than you would during a period of low variability. So it's like during this period, it wouldn't be really be beneficial to um, decrease the plant uh, set point too much and stay there since the, the period's only short. But for this one, you want to de keep decreasing um, since it's a much longer period of variability. Um, and then this K parameter is, again, another tuning parameter that we can base on either the size of our battery storage, or of our energy storage system, or on the cost of variability. So if we are getting charged for the amount of variability we inject onto the grid, then we may want to be better off uh, curtailing more than if we, uh, curtailing more to offset um, what those penalty costs would be. So we can implement this in simulation using a variety of energy storage systems, but the simplest is just to use a battery model 
Uh, so here's just a linear battery model and some data sheet values where the key takeaway from the data sheet is that we're limited um, by the maximum power that we can get out of our battery. So when you're dealing with variability reduction, uh, the important thing um, out of the battery is how much can you actually offset with the battery. So even if you had a large capacity battery, you can only offset about half of its capacity um, with its power output, So, which would correspond to a C rating of 0.5 C. So this is just the simulation of the previous day at different battery uh, sizes. So when we don't have a battery at all, so when the, the battery size is zero, then we're mainly relying on our curtailment factor to offset the variability throughout the day. Whereas when we have a larger battery, then we can use, um, we can be more aggressive and operate closer to um, just the average maximum power point throughout the day. So here are the, the energy efficiencies in relation to the, what we would get if we just operate at maximum power point throughout the day. So of course the, the best you can always do out of an array is operating at maximum power point, but with this one um, we're getting much less variability. Um, so just a note, uh, with this system, since we're operating at um, an average value, we're spending as much time above the set point as we are below it. So charging the battery is pretty simple in that whenever the maximum power point's above the set point, we can just um, you operate, the, or operate the PV plant above the set point to charge the battery. So you, it's basically just because we're following the average that charging isn't really an issue with this, uh, with this strategy. So uh, if we want to look at the, the variability reduction, so there's several methods to, you, to look at variability reduction in solar arrays. One of them is ramp rate detection. So ramp rate's just the change in power versus the, uh, the change in time defined here. Where in solar arrays, um, the literature is kind of proposed, or a couple of utilities have proposed in the literature that we can limit our ramp rates um, to below 10% of the nameplate capacity per, chain, per minute. So basically, the solar plant doesn't change by more than 10% per minute. Then um, that will be kind of the, the goal of operating uh, solar arrays for the, the present, uh, present case. So one way to uh, look at variability reduction is to see how many times we actually violate this limit and then just do a simple event count uh, here, shown here on the right, um, where operating at maximum power point, we have the most event counts or the most ramp rate violations. And then using this algorithm, we can see we have much less variation in our plant um, as turned by the ramp rate. So even though, so the trade-off here is that we're losing some energy um, in terms of energy harvested from the sun, and we're increasing our costs by using a battery system, but we're reducing our variability uh, significantly. So the idea here is that uh, right now, where variability is not really penalized on a solar rate, this is not really an economic uh, approach. But in the future, if we want to keep adding solar to the grid, then vari the cost of variability, or what, whether we're penalized for it or whether we're not allowed to have an array, will begin to offset this. So we're going to be moving from an array that's just always producing as much power as it wants, um, or as much power as it can, to an array that's producing a more uh, uniform power output. Uh, so if we extend our uh, simulation results from the day to uh, a one-year irradiance, or to one uh, to one year. Um, this is what we get for our energy harvest. So obviously, as we increase our battery, then we can operate closer to that uh, average set point uh, and get closer to the maximum power to the energy we'd get if we operated the system at maximum power point. But we still only get we still only lose about 14% by operating um, with no battery at all. So this would be the worst case in this situation. But then if we look at the energy, the variability reduction, we can see that we uh, get good variability reduction even with no battery. So we only have 16% of the, very, of the uh, event counts that we'd have uh, when we operated the, the array at maximum power point. So it's still, um, it's 
basically a, almost a one to one. So you trade 16% power to get 16%, uh, you trade 16% power and you get, oh, oh no, that's not one, it's one minus. So uh, for 16% power trade off, you get 16% of the variability. Um, so this is just kind of a summary of the two previous slides. Um, so we have the energy harvest in red, um, the variability reduction in black, and then the projected system costs in blue and green. So the green is if we have to replace the battery at 10 years, um, we obviously would increase the, the cost of the system. Um, so, and all this is normalized to the array at maximum power point. So that has, the array at maximum power point has an energy harvest of one, a variability of one, and an install of one. So we just normalize everything to that array. So we're still working on actually putting a dollar value to um, variability. Basically, how does, how much can I charge or how much can I get if I operate my array at a reduced um, output, but I have a much more uniform array. So um, until we get there, we can just use this simple weighting, weighted cost function um, where we're relating the energy um, produced, <clears throat> the energy produced per unit cost with the variability. So this weighting factor X just determines what we're putting our focus on. So if X is one, um, then we only care about uh, the energy produced in the system, um, whereas X is say 0.5, then we care about both the energy produced in the system and the variability reduction. So this is just the cost function for um, whether or not if we have to replace the battery at 10 years or not. So if you're, so with this cost function, again, the, the array at maximum power point with no battery storage has a cost of always one, because this is just one over one, and that's one. So it's just x plus one minus x. So the cost is just one. So depending on how we weight our variability, um, we could see whether or not the system um, is better off than the system just operating at maximum power point. So this is kind of where we're operating, where we're at in present day, where we don't really penalize variability. But as we move towards the future, then we might get into weighting factors down here. And once that occurs, once we start actually charging people for variability, then it would be better off to not operate their plants at maximum power point and to have a, um, <clears throat> but have a, a reduced uh, output um, if it means they can uh, decrease their variability. So in conclusion, um, variability is growing concern as solar capacity increases and because uh, solar is pretty new. Uh, all these problems are only, I mean, solar's only really taken off in the last 10 years, so we've only really um, started looking at these problems in the last five years. So it's all relatively new. Um, whereas solutions to mitigating um, variability must be economically feasible. So you can't have just a trivial solution where you just put a giant battery on your system that can output the, the amount of your array, because that would never be economically feasible. And so as uh, the cost of variability increases, then a reduced plant control can begin to reduce this need for large expensive components. And this may ultimately be more economical than just operating at maximum power point all the time. So uh, that's, I'll take questions if you have them. Yeah, so I set a minimum. So yeah, if so, you have like a lot of noise on your system, then you can uh, begin to run into the, like problems where if you have like a one second variation, then it, it but I set a, a limit on it um, to get rid of the noise. And I, I tried to denoise my signals. Um, to answer your question, no, uh, it's not necessarily all these time periods are greater than a minute. So say if you, if you switch 5% in 30 seconds, that would be a RAM rate violation. But I tried to set it up so that I have a lower limit on the on my time frame, so that I'm not getting like, oh, I changed one percent in one second, so that's a rampant violation. 
or else this kind of balloons. And this, I mean, this number is big because you get two ramp. So for every step change in the output, you get two ramp rates. So you get the down one and the up one. Whereas if you had the set, if you're just op, if you're able to operate at the set point, nothing changes between the two of them. Um, so if I understand, so if you just operate, just disconnecting 10% of the. Yeah, so I, I, well, if I understood this correctly, like you're basically determining a set point that, let's say for it as an example, it's like 90% of the MPP value. So now you're like setting, it's a set point to track a lower value that's let's say 90% as opposed to operating 90% of the arrays at the full MPP value and just like disconnecting 10% of the arrays, or is it basically the same? It's just like so the, the problem is that when a cloud goes over the array, the whole array will go down with it. So it's like it, so you go, so if, if, uh, if your whole array goes from 90% output to 20% output, I don't see how connect, disconnecting any of it would do anything. But I think I, so, well, yeah. The other, the other part of that relates to the dynamic, right? I mean, you're not operating at 90% of MPP. You're operating at 90% of some low pass yeah. estimate. Of yeah, MPP. yeah. So that changes too. You've got to have the head. Right. So um, you're paying quite a lot of the cost to get this reduced variability in terms of well, that's kind of that's kind of like the 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 big question is where does this variability get paid back? And so um, that's kind of what we're trying to quantify now. So if if utilities start penalizing solar arrays for being too for having too much variable, then that would get factored in. Or if say they could say you can't have an array on our grid anymore because our grid has too much solar, then you have to quantify the, that opportunity cost of if I want to put an array or not. So it's a difficult. And then there's other things like there, there's um, there's equipment wear and tear from having your your voltage regulators bouncing back and forth um, throughout the day when you have a lot of variability. So it's a difficult um, thing to quantify. Um, but that seems to be where it's moving towards in terms of regulations and laws. So um, I think several uh, utilities, maybe in California, have started putting in ramp rate kind of controls on their on their systems. But is that a real value or is it a perceived value? I would argue that if you have high frequency. Uh, Variations in time, you would also have high frequency thresholds. But yeah, in space, variations. <clears throat> so if you have multiple plants, <clears throat> they would cancel out. Yeah, so that's another thing. Uh, I, don't even, I don't even have a. Oh, here you go. Uh, yeah, that's known as geographic smoothing, um, where as you increase, as you kind of combine more and more plants together, then you get an averaging effect. So if you only have one plant, you can get this. But if you have five, then it, it all begins to average out. And that could be, that's another thing we're looking at. Is, um, say if I only have to reduce, so here obviously you have less variability to mitigate than if you just have the single plant. But then that also, um, it gets to the point where you're, then you're saying, OK, this will work if the amount of solar in this region quadrupled or something. But how do, how do you get to that point? If you're starting from scratch. Yep. One, one question, one comment. First one is, your your nameplate on the battery showed an efficiency of 92%, which is a nice optimistic number, but it certainly means that if you handle all your variability by going in and out of batteries, you're really only going to be able to deliver 92% of your maximum power point. Have you factored in that that energy loss? 
E, oops. So in my battery equation, uh, I have an efficiency here on the charge of 92%. That, that can't be the round trip efficiency. No, that's a round trip efficiency for a, for a lithium ion battery is actually pretty close to it. It's optimistic, but it's not. Why? Wow. <coughs> Including the power electronics and everything? Uh, no, just the battery. Just the battery. <laughs> just the battery. So point, point is taken that, that, yeah, you've got to have the discharge and the, and the charge efficiency in there. For a lithium ion battery, the first order, they're more or less symmetrical. Okay. So you have to you'll have to put that in, yeah. Well, I think if I if I include it on both terms, then it would be 92%, 92%. It would be squared. That's no, that's the total. That's round trip. 92% is round trip. Okay. For a, for a good lithium ion battery. Yeah. Having done that in life. <laughs> okay. Um, but the other one is is a comment related to to his point. The geographic diversity issue will help you at the broad system level. Yeah. yeah but it won't help you with distribution feeders and tap changing under load transformers and all the other things that are trying to do local regulation. Right? Yeah. So you're still going to have a cost. The utility still has a cost of very Right. Yeah. So there's balancing costs and then there's equipment costs, there's voltage limit costs, and there's, there's a lot of costs. <laughs> and the question is, how can they share some of those costs right. with, the, with the solar owner, so to speak? Right. Which clearly would get you away from maximum power as the, as the optimal operation. Yes. As you say, at maximum power, you get maximum energy production, but you also get maximum variability. Right. If variability is not free, then you shouldn't be doing maximum energy production. Yeah, so the way I see it is they will either start penalizing solar plants for having too much variability or start offering a premium for solar plants that have low variability. And in either of those cases, there's you can optimize the results to make it profitable. I think, is there any other? No, okay, thank you. Actually, don't run away. Don't run away. Stay. Stay. There will be pizza at the IEEE PSPLS oh, election. Oh, I think Yeah. So our next speaker is Kathleen, and she earned a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She is currently finishing up her MS here at Illinois, and then is headed off to Boston to start her career at IBM. Outside of school, she loves biking, eating vegan food, and admiring beautiful sunsets and sunrises. Heck Without yeah. Without further ado, here's Kathleen. Thank you. This thing was not made for buttoning on this side. It's made for buttoning the other way. That's a fun fact. OK. Do you want me to get started or wait? Doesn't matter. OK. I can, you're fine. Um, OK, so my talk's going to be about PMU data visualizations and how they can be used to help improve operation of the electric grid. So to start, I wanted to provide an overview of the electric grid, which you all know about. One, because it provides a nice segue into why PMUs are needed. But two, I was feeling a little nostalgic since this is my last presentation as a grad student. So I wanted to throw in some fun facts that I have learned along the way that you all might find interesting. So in 476, this is where my great aha moment came. Professor Overby said, the North American electric grid is divided into four regions that are called interconnections. I was like, oh, that's so cool. And each of these operates pretty much by themselves, um, asynchronously, as Professor Sauer likes to point out to me whenever I talk about this. And they're only connected through these high voltage DC tie lines. So between the western interconnection in green and the eastern interconnection in blue. You have six of these DC tie lines. Up north, between the Quebec interconnection and the eastern interconnection, you have four DC lines, DC lines and a variable frequency transformer, which I haven't yet looked into, but now that I know it's a thing, I'm going to look that up. And then between Texas and the eastern inter interconnection, you have um, two DC tie lines. So then. When he first posed this to me, I was like, okay, so how do utilities then fit into that picture? And his answer to me was, well, it's complicated. I said, well, thank you, um, which is true, but I wanted to know more. So I dug into it, 
And I found that there's lots of layers to getting from the interconnect down to the utility level. So that starts with these two overseeing bodies. You have NERC and FERC. The North American Electricity Reliability Corporation is responsible for making sure the grid runs as you would expect. So the operational side of things, planning, making sure the physical infrastructure works. On the other side, you have FERC, at least in the United States, that monitors the markets. So I am not a markets person. That is something else. But I want to touch quickly on the operational side of things that NERC handles. So NERC defines these 18 roles that an organization can have. And this is where Professor Overby astutely noted that it gets complicated. You can have an organization have, be in charge of one of these or multiple of these. And the ones that I want to just touch on are the re reliability coordinator, planning, uh, excuse me, balancing authority, and the transmission operator. So first, this is like your highest level of operational structure, and that's your reliability coordinator. And they're in charge of making sure everything within an interconnection is running as expected. Things are, uh, equipment is being run in such a way that it's inside the limits that they're defined to run in. And you have each of these organizations that have registered with NERC and said, yes, I'm going to do my job as a reliability coordinator. And these are those entities. So Texas is both an interconnect and a reliability coordinator. And you have these various ones spread out through each of the interconnections. Then the next level down, you have the transmission operators, so your RTOs and ISOs. And these do somewhat the same job of a reliability coordinator, except they do it on a smaller scale. So they're just worrying about their region, making sure everybody that's in their area is following the laws of the land, making sure the equipment is running within the limits that have been defined. And they're not as concerned with looking outside of their area as the reliability coordinator is. So then moving on, there's the next step down, which is the balancing authority. And these people are in charge of making sure that the power, um, be, that the power being consumed in their region is equal to the power either being generated or imported from other regions outside of that area. And so you'll notice that, for example, PJM or ERCOT actually functions as both a, reli as a reliability coordinator, a transmission operator, and a balancing authority. So things are complicated and complex. And then finally, I got to my utilities that I was curious about. So this is where utilities fit into the picture um, within like a balancing authority. So this is for PJM. You have like ComEd, Dayton Power and Light, First Energy in Ohio. Uh, and so all of these people are involved in making sure the grid runs correctly. So what I hope to emphasize here or convince you of is that physically, as we all know, the electric grid is very complex. There's a lot of parts to make this work. Um, and it also is complex in operating it. There's a lot of people that have to be involved coordinating with one another to make sure that ru things run smoothly. And despite this complexity, things do run smoothly because everyone works together. However, when that's not happening, when something, when people are not all on the same page, you get something like this. In 2003, the North America, the Northeast blackout uh, in August, 50 million people lost power. Now, why was this? Someone was sabotaging the grid? No. What happened was that a utility, let's call it First Energy, an operator was monitoring their system and they missed something. Well. They missed something, so then they weren't able to call Allegheny Power or Comet or Dayton Power and Light and say, hey, you've got a problem coming down the line. Maybe you need to start thinking about how to respond to that. And so what turned out, what started as one problem cascaded into this whole blackout. Um, lots and lots and lots of problems. So after this, people said, okay, well, we have to do something better. Uh, what can we do? So along came PMUs phaser measurement units. And the nice thing about phaser measurement units is one, they record the vital signs of the electric grid. So your frequency, voltage, and current. Uh, they assign a timestamp, which is not crazy cool, except for the fact that the timestamp they assign comes from global positioning system, meaning that all the PMUs are using the same cl reference clock. So whether you take a measurement in Washington or New York, 
all of them are using the exact same clock, which allows you to integrate data. Everybody can be on the same page. And the third thing, they do this very fast. So PMUs can record data at least 30 times per second, which is about 60 times faster than the current systems. So to put that in a power system context, this is from Professor Sauer. Um, SCADA is shown in blue. That's what it's capable of measuring. And PMUs are shown in green, and this is what they're capable of measuring. You notice they are start, starting to be able to measure switching surges and power electronics variations, which you small wire people know all about. <laughs> so good you stayed. <laughs> um, lightning, speed of light, so good luck, PMUs. Not getting there. Um, so that's the context of what PMUs are able to measure. And so obviously these are very great. Uh, a lot of potential seem to be able to do a lot of good things. And the federal government thought so too. In 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, the federal government allocated lots of money um, to install PMUs and the communication infrastructure across, the, across North America. So these blue dots are all the PMUs that have been installed. And I think I have a picture, yeah. So a PMU is installed at a substation. It connects with potential transformers and current transformers. And then records all its measurements and sends it to these yellow stars, which you may or may not be able to see, but I tried to zoom or blow it up with this big yellow star. Um, sends the data up to a data concentrator. So multiple PMUs send their data to a data concentrator. That integrates all of it and then sends it up one more level to the regional data concentrator. And so what this allows you to do is get information about the entire interconnect. So now we eliminate that problem of utilities not being able to communicate with one another. And this is a picture, um, I tried to, uh, hopefully you can see, kind of see it, but these, these lines show the data flow. So in the western interconnect, these green lines that are very faint are data that's being exchanged between utilities. Um, the faint red lines are data that's being exchanged between the local uh, data concentrators, those yellow stars. And then the red ones are data that's flowing from between regional entities. So at least in the West, it looks like there's a lot of data flowing. Everybody's on the same page. Lots of good stuff happening. East Coast, it's at least radi radially going out. So people have a lot more information than they did when the Northeast blackout happened. And then you see the other things. So good stuff happening, lots of, lots of uh, PMUs have been installed and the infra infrastructure is in place. So this is great. But now we have the challenge of having a lot of data, but haven't yet done anything with it. So that's where my project has come in. Uh, the Bonneville Power Administration in the Pacific Northwest came to us and said, okay, we have all these PMUs installed. Uh, we've created some visualizations with it. We've done some stuff with the data, but we need you to help us um, do some more cool things to figure out what's going on. We said, okay, we can do that. Uh, so what we wanted to use is software, because there's so much data, we can't parse it all by ourselves, uh, by hand. And two, we needed a solution that was going to include the operators in the process. Uh, operators have been running their electric grid for a very long time have a lot of expertise, and so whatever solution we came up with couldn't just be a computer algorithm that we created with uh, the operators isolated. So our solution needed to incorporate both the software and the operator, and the magical bridge between the two was visualizations. Um, and so this allows us to transform numerical data that is undete undetectable, not helpful to a human into something that an operator can do something with pretty quickly. And so to do that, we had to crea create our own setup. Um, as you may know, I'm not a reliability coordinator, nor a balancing authority, nor a transmission operator. I don't have a grid to play with. So we created our own. We created a model in Power World um, of Bonneville Power Administration's network. Created some events like earthquakes, ice storms, transformers going off, transmission lines going out to affect it and see what would happen. And then collected the data as if we were PMUs, said, okay, let's put a PMU at that substation and that substation and see what happens. And then let's create those visualizations to show to the operator. So that's what we did. And just as proof to show you, I did actually do something. 
This is for an ice storm scenario, which I said, okay, let's assume we have transmission lines up here in northern Montana and Idaho being knocked out due to an ice storm. So rain or whatever, ice builds up on the lines, they get heavy, fall to the ground, problems. Um, and so these are the substations in that region, and that's the area on a big map. So the first visualization we came up with was to create sort of a summative picture of what was happening, but also provide enough detail that an operator could do something with the information that they have. So as you can see up here, there's lots of blue dots, which is fine, but these red dots stick out, and that's what we wanted. That region, if you'll recall from the previous slide, is the same region where I created the problems. So the visualization and the software is correctly identifying problem buses, and then you can see what those pro, uh, what those what that data looks like for those problem buses. Um, voltage angle is somewhat helpful, but what's easier to detect over here, you have a green, which you can't see from back there, and I apologize for that. Um, you have a green marker here that corresponds to this green line here that says, oh, something the voltage is dropping to zero. So either a bus is disconnected, a transmission line is disconnected, or there's a transformer taken offline. So just in this visualization, I'm able to detect the area where there's a problem and the likely cause of that problem, which is a huge help to an operator um, to cover for their large footprint. They're able to quickly identify this. Another visualization we came up with um, was to play on taking the first derivative of the measurements. So this histogram is showing um, the maximum of the first derivative for each uh, PMU that records data. So what we like to see is that everything is in here, meaning that the maximum deviates from zero very little. Uh, the problems are out here where you have five, four PMUs recording uh, big spikes, you have four PMUs recording big spikes, and two uh, PMUs recording big spikes over there. And then again, this is plotting the outlier buses or uh, PMUs, and then again, geographically locating them. And you'll see, once again, I've identified that northern region of Montana and Idaho as cause for concern. So just by sending the data through this, I've given the operator in a way to say, okay, this is the area I need to focus on, and it's likely that I have a bus or a transmission line going out of service. So that's very helpful. Um, that's just zoomed in, so this is the voltage magnitude plot. And what you're seeing in blue is actually this Lion Mountain substation, which is one that I knocked a transmission line out to. So I'm not making it up, it did actually work. And when I was doing the visualization software, I really wanted it to be something that I could pass down to someone else to use. And so it's very generalized, very user friendly. All of my code will be up on GitHub. And basically the premise is if you have data that you can put in the format that I define in all my documentation, um, power system model data, so things like what is your substation's name, what is its geographic location, or how many generators do you have, and then your simulation data from an ice storm or an earthquake. If you feed that into my software tool, you'll get these visualizations. And like I said, that'll be on GitHub. So that was my project, and that's all I got. So thank you to VPA, my advisor, and all of you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> questions? Oh, I also have a 515 book. If anyone wants a 515 book, <laughs> I have one. Otherwise, it's going in the recycling. You want it? <laughs> you got it. Historical. Yep. Yep. So it'll do it in seconds. seconds. Yeah, which may not be fast enough, but that's also on my four gigabyte memory. So this, yep, that's a good point. So this is for uh, 1,500 buses, and uh, one of the ways that you could reduce the amount of data you're processing is just 
shrink the window of time you're looking at um, and just throw away the old data as you go. But that's definitely a concern. Um, what are the uh, computing resources you have to do these calculations? Yes. Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. So yeah. I've seen a few times the picture of the, of the country with the PMUs. Uh -huh. And does Nebraska not have PMUs because they're not a swing state? <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. Um, uh, Pecky, didn't one of the presenters say that too? Not the swing state thing, but he was like, no one in Nebraska, has, they don't have a PMU. Um, I think that's the, a good explanation. I think that's why, actually. Yeah. Yeah, they, they didn't have a political likelihood of voting, so the, for a, I don't know. Well, now we have it on record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask my uh, my advisor. I told someone I was going to ask him at Nebraska. Yeah, anyone? So you talked about the balancing authorities and ISOs, mm -hmm. and that was a rather complicated story. But yes, Can you explain agree. that relationship one more time? Because I always thought that the ISOs were what were the ones that coordinated power generation. Yes. You said only in two cases they actually coincide. Oh, uh, OK. So you can have, you so can so have. To uh, restate it, yeah. what would Um, what is an ISO that it isn't a balancing authority do? So they would still be, so l let's say you have um, like the California ISO. I don't think they're a balancing authority. I'd have to go back to my, my map. Um, but they would have balancing authorities within them. And so their job would be to say, is the transmission infrastructure between those two entities sufficient to transfer power? Um, or am I going to break things if I do that? Is there uh, uh, you know, maybe it's okay if I just do it for a real quick second. Um, so, th so they would be monitoring that for balancing authorities. If you're also a balancing authority, then you kind of have the advantage of already knowing what's going on with everything around you with all the other balancing authorities because you're getting your part of that process. Does that kind of help? Kind of? No. And I don't think so, but okay. a single, there wasn't. Balancing authorities weren't always inside a single ISO. I don't think it was a balance. That, that was not correct. Is that right? Um, I'm saying, was there, did it do balancing authority, uh, authorities stand between ISOs? Oh, I don't know. They would need, well, I don't think so. They wouldn't have to be because there's some parts of the US. So like if these are your transmission operators, this region would only be monitored by your reliability coordinator, but you have balancing authorities within that area. So, yes. I think that you can correct me if I yeah. know that the ISO is the one that runs the electricity market. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And say you can't actually do that. Got it. Yes, I in the market for the hour, and then the balancing authority will handle blitz within. Got it. That's a good clarification. Thank you. Who pays for the blitz? Swing states. Yeah. Uh, does your visualization or processing always rely on uh, time aligned data that's at the same frequency? or? Um, right now, it does assume that it's time aligned, but um, I think I can make that fix pretty easily. That's a good point. I'm going to add that to my list of to-dos. Yeah. Uh, could you give an, an example of uh, what kind of decision an operator would take and what you would base it on? What is it they're trying to see in your in the visualization. Um, so that's a good question. And um, well, 
what comes to, what comes to mind is when talking to the uh, people that I've been working with and then reading the papers on it, right now the control room is such that if there is a problem happening, there are alarms going off like crazy. And uh, within that, operators aren't really able to understand what they need to focus on most. And um, so in this case, by just having this visualization, they can quickly identify it, didn't have to set off you know, thousands of alarms, maybe just one or none, they can quickly see this. And then um, maybe they just need to dispatch someone to go check the transmission lines or um, retry the circuit breaker or look at uh, going up to the uh, ISO or to the balancing authority and say, okay, I'm not getting power from this area anymore. Can I get some transactions to circumvent in this problem area? Yeah. I think there was an example maybe from 476, possibly also with the Bonneville, uh -huh. where there was a case where um, I think the generator might have an unstable control loop for uh -huh. visualization be some way of seeing where these fluctuations, these oscillations might come from. You could also see that. We were try I was trying to create a good oscillation scenario with my smaller model, but I couldn't get a good one just because I reduced it down so much that I couldn't get a good oscillation. So I haven't tried it, but I'd like to see if it would work. Yeah? What language is this in? Python. Yeah. OK. Sweet. You want the 515 book. I know. It's OK, Fu. Um, because I, I love, no. Um, I was looking for balancing authorities, and this was the best map. And I didn't love this map. Uh, and it's just the United States. I have the whole North American con Yeah. Right. But when you get to balancing authorities, this was the only one. This was from EIA, which is US based. So I don't know. I'll have to look into that. I assume it's the same, because they're still using the same reliability coordinator structure and all that good stuff. OK, sweet. Thanks, everyone.